If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Uh, Nick, this is a quote by Nikola Tesla, supposedly. And uh, so today we're going to talk about physics in the frequency domain. So um, my quote, analogous to Nikola Tesla's quote, is if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, think in terms of the frequency domain. Now what I'm going to do today, this was originally going to be a video on relativity and it will definitely be. Uh, we will be talking about relativity, um, but I needed to take a few steps back and I want to get back to the um, to modified unit analysis, which I define differently than the standard model uh, when it comes to the uh, domain of frequency. Now frequency can come in many forms. You can have a frequency of flow, which we refer to as current. We can have a uh, frequency of a wave, which we refer to as propagation, and we can have frequency of transfer. Now this uh, is uh, what we refer to as emission and absorption. And so this emission and absorption is going to be uh, what we're going to be focusing on today. And for this, we're going to be um, using the example of the cesium-133 uh, atom uh, as an atomic clock. Okay, so an atomic clock is a clock that uses the resonant frequencies of atoms as a resonator. Okay, cesium-133 is the element most commonly chosen for atomic clocks. When a cesium atom receives microwave energy at exactly the right frequency, the electrons in the atom begin to transition back and forth between energy states or energy levels. Now this is the emission and, and absorption cycle that I was talking about. So um, the cesium atom absorbs uh, radiation and emits radiation through the electrons. And the electrons jump up and down a level and they resonate up and down, back and forth, however you want, in and out, however you want to visualize that. Uh, the point is that the atom absorbs the, the microwave energy and emits the microwave energy. And in the cesium-133 atom, it does it very precisely and very accurately. And the resonant frequency of the cesium atom is um, 9,192,631,770 hertz. Now this value is exact and it's got no decimal places and this is because um, the second in the NIST, in the, uh, in the standard, in, in the um, international standard or NIST, N-I-S-T, um, is set to exactly this value. So this frequency is the same as saying one second. So 9,192,631,770 hertz is exactly one second. So here we're going to begin our discussion about modified unit analysis. Now modified unit analysis, this is something that I'm developing. And um, so uh, the difference between standard unit analysis and modified unit analysis is that I add a, um, a symbol uh, for the term cycle. And so I add a domain, which I call the domain of oscillation. And the unit of the domain of oscillation is um, delta. Delta, this is the delta, the Greek symbol delta, and delta means change in, um, in mathematics. And this would be one unit of change, which would be one oscillation. And so the uh, unit of frequency, which I'm calling clock frequency in this case, so we're talking about clocks, we're talking about emission absorption, emission absorption, emission absorption, and that's our clock. Okay, so I'm a computer scientist, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with the phenomenon of a clock. The, the CPU, the central processing unit of a computer, is driven by a clock. And that clock has a certain clock frequency in the, you know, these days it would be in the, in the gigahertz, uh, uh, millions of hertz. Um, 
And so that's where, why I'm calling this clock frequency. So it's a very specific kind of frequency. It's not flow frequency. It is uh, literally like a clock ticking. Okay, so the reciprocal of this is the time period. So the reciprocal of clock frequency is the time period. And in modified unit analysis, time period has units seconds per cycle. Now in standard unit analysis, uh, the units of clock frequency are one over S. And that's, uh, that's technically referred to as Hertz. And so this is, I've talked about this in, um, in my other work, in my other papers, in my other um, videos, but I'm just going to reiterate it here. Um, there is a bug in the program, I call it a bug, um, where the, uh, they put the numerical value of one, the identity of the real numbers one, into the unit section by naming, by calling the unit of frequency one over S for Hertz, that's the unit of the clock frequency, um, they are using the numerical value of one and not a symbol. So in unit analysis, um, the second, the meter, the kilogram, the coulomb, those are all um, just sort of placeholders for an actual value. And yet in standard unit analysis, you put an actual value the numerical value of one into the unit section and they actually use it as the numerical value of one. So this is a mistake. I believe this is a mistake. I've written about it. I've talked about it. And so here, this is where the problem, I think the confusion about uh, electromagnetic energy and the photon uh, stems from this problem. Okay, so the reciprocal of um, frequency is the time period, okay? And in standard unit analysis, the time period is given the units of S per second. And I believe this is wrong. I believe um, if they had written S over one in the unit section, then, then it would have been fine. So it would have been one of the reciprocal of one over S is S over one, and that one means one cycle. But they're using the numerical value of one sorry, they're using the unit of one as the numerical value of one, and they're giving the units of a time period, the units of S um, instead of S over one, which, which would be technically more accurate because that would mean, because the time period of a wave is the time for one period of the wave, for one cycle, for one oscillation. And so to be more complete, Modified unit analysis uh, assigns the units of delta of uh, change of delta over s. This is a symbol. It means one clock cycle, um, and the reciprocal of the clock frequency is um, s over delta. So you know you you switch these two and you get the reciprocal, and that is the time period. So I think this is an important detail that shouldn't be overlooked. So this is modified unit analysis. I'm calling it my specification. Okay, this is modified unit analysis in the frequency domain in a nutshell. So this is, um, this is my cheat sheet, if you wanna call it that. If you printed this out, you would have you know modified unit analysis in a nutshell on one piece of paper. So I was able to compress um, all of my ideas and all of my papers and all my videos into one slide. This is the most important um, slide of modified unit analysis. And um, so this is really nice. As a computer scientist, I like to uh, compress things and then compress them again. And if I can, I would like to compress them again to get the, to put as much information on the smallest um, region of space as possible. And so this is modified unit analysis, um, you know, in a nutshell. And so I just wanted to point out, I'll get back to this in a second, but um, I just wanted to show you a little bit of the history of how this came about. Um, my original use of the term modified unit analysis uh, comes from a paper I wrote called Calibrating the Universe and Why We Need to Do It. And this was published in Physics Essays in um, February, uh, sorry, in June of 2016. 
sorry, it was actually published online July 30th in 2016. <clears throat> so this is where I first start talking about Planck's constant and redefining Planck's constant um, in terms of um, modified unit analysis. And then I followed that up a few years later with my paper called Planck's Constant and the Nature of Light, which you can find on ResearchGate. And again, I'm talking about Planck's Constant. And um, I'm just going to read you the last little part here where I say, this interpretation of Planck's energy equation leads to a much simpler interpretation of light, which can be modeled using the same mathematical construct, which is Euler's formula like all other oscillating wave phenomenon. And so uh, I'm bringing all wave phenomenon together in modified unit analysis and doing everything. And by doing that, I can do physics in the frequency domain. And um, then if you want to convert to wavelength, you convert to wavelength. If you want to convert to mass, you convert to mass. If you want to convert to momentum, you convert to momentum. So this is uh, a little bit of the history of how this you know, line of thinking came about. So um, let's get back to our example of the cesium atom as an atomic clock. Now the resonant frequency, the resonant frequency of the cesium atom, cesium-133, is um, this value 9,192,631,770 cycles per second. Now, if you take the reciprocal of that, you get the resonant time period of the cesium atom, which is 1.08787257757 uh, times 10 to the minus 10 seconds per cycle. So it's not some arbitrary time uh, period. It's not some arbitrary time, but it is the time for one cycle of the emission absorption um, process of the cesium atom. And this is uh, the number written out without the 10 to the minus 10. This is 0 0.0000000108, this number here. So you can see it is a very tiny number, the time period of the cesium atom emission absorption cycle is very, very small. So I want to get back to this uh, modified unit analysis specification. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to the cesium atom. I'm going to show you how to apply this to the, um, the cesium-133 atom that is used uh, for atomic clocks in GPS systems and other systems that require, um, you know, very accurate clocks. And so um, I start off with defining the time period. Uh, with the units, the units of the time period, which are seconds per cycle. This cycle is very important. It's not just some arbitrary time. It is a time period of one cycle of uh, electromagnetic energy of a certain frequency. And the clock frequency has uh, units cycles per second, so delta per second. And this would this this, this is the unit of uh, frequency in modified unit analysis. And then I make a few simple definitions. Mass, I define as a quantity of matter, and inertia is defined as resistance to change. And so these are unitless values. These are just ideas, okay? Mass is a quantity of matter. Matter is the thing that we're looking at here. So an atom is a, you know, is, a, is matter. And so a quantity of matter is, you know, like you hold a, a, a chunk of, metal in your hand. That is a quantity of matter. Um, and so mass and matter are obviously related, but I, kind of, I would distinguish um, mass. I, mass is a slightly different definition than in the standard uh, model. And then inertia as resistance to change. This is also just an idea um, because there are many ways that change can be resisted. For example, if you have an object sitting on a table, it is resisting um, any is resisting motion. I have to act on it to make it move. And if an object is in motion, let's say I'm out, I'm in outer space, and I throw a ball, that ball is going to keep moving. Uh, it's got inertia. It's got, going to keep moving, and it's going to resist being stopped. It's going to resist being any change in direction. 
So inertia also doesn't have units because inertia can be applied in many situations. Okay, so now I've got um, three definitions that do have units. Okay, uh, I've got potential inertia. Okay, so or just potential, you can just call it potential, but technically you can call it potential inertia. Potential inertia is stillness inertia. That is the cup sitting on the table. Uh, it is resisting uh, change in position, I guess you could say, change in motion. And so this would be, uh, in terms of Newton's law, you would say an object in stillness remains in stillness or an object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an external force. Um, this is analogous to rest mass in the standard model, and it is given the units kg for kilogram. Uh, but in modified unit analysis, I use P for potential. So when you see P in my unit analysis, you can replace that with kg, kilogram, for, um, to relate it to the standard units. Kinetic or kinetic inertia is, uh, could also be called motion inertia. So in terms of Newton's, Newton's laws, this would be an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an external force. So this would be once you set a quantity of matter into motion, then um, you're going to have to apply a force to change or stop that motion. This is uh, historically referred to as, as momentum. So in mainstream physics, this is called momentum and it has units kilograms, meters per second, or you know mass times velocity. And, but in modified unit analysis, I am going to give this the units of K for kinetic or kinetic inertia. And uh, so when you see K in my unit analysis, think kinetic. And when you see P, think potential. And then there's another one, um, energy. So energy is energy. I left the name the same because, um, you know, energy is, it's a fine, it's a perfectly fine word. Uh, I also refer to it as resonant inertia. And this is different. This is different than what, um, what we would normally find. Um, and so you would say an object in resonance remains in resonance unless acted upon by an external resonant frequency. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what I mean by that, and then we'll get back to the rest of the specification. So here's some software that I wrote. Let me just run this for you. Um, let's just see here. So I'm gonna start this. So what I developed here was a spring mass system. This is a spring mass system. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to begin a resonance in this lattice. So I'm going to wiggle the lattice. What I did was I expanded the outer um, spring masses out here and, what, and just pulled them out. And what this did was this generated a resonance in the middle. Now I am not doing anything right now. The simulator now is continuing the resonance that I created by pulling these string, spring masses out this caused a resonance in the spring mass system, and this is going to resonate forever because I don't have any damping in the springs. The springs are modeled as if there's no damping, they're not gonna slow down. And so this is what I mean by an object in resonance remains in resonance. And uh, so this uh, is uh, what I mean by um, you know energy inertia. Okay, so back to the um, modified unit analysis specification. So next, what I have are three, um, three constants of nature. I'm gonna call them constants of nature. One is uh, the quantum of potential, quantum of potential inertia, okay? And um, so this is value is, is quite small. This, you can call this the quantum of mass. In other papers, I call it the quantum of mass. Um, but then I changed my definition of mass to a quantity of matter. So this is a quantum of uh, matter. This is a quantum of potential inertia, which matter is. 
And um, so the value of 7.3 and all these digits times 10 to the minus 51, 10 to the minus 51 is 0 0.0000000 with 51 zeros um, and or 50 zeros and then this number here. And so that is a very, very, very small um, pixel of mass, pixel of matter. And so this is a constant of nature in modified unit analysis specification. The next uh, quantum constant is the constant of kinetic inertia, the, or the constant of motion inertia, or you can call it the quantum of momentum. In other papers that I've written, I call it quantum of momentum. Uh, but in my specification, I'm trying to be, uh, I want to define things in terms of potential and kinetic inertia. And so that is what I'm doing here. And so this is also a very small number, uh, 2.210, blah, 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 10 to the minus 42. Again, a very, very small number. And it's got units of um, momentum per cycle, kinetic inertia per cycle. Um, and so this is one cycle of momentum. And then the final constant here, which I call the quantum of energy. In my other papers, I also call it the quantum of energy. This is for all intents and purposes, uh, Planck's constant, only in modified unit analysis. This value has units of energy per cycle or joule in mainstream, it would be joules per cycle. And so each of these are, um, in the domain of cycle. So this uh, quantum of potential, quantum of mass is mass per cycle. Now that one is not as intuitive as the other ones, but you will see that um, this is also very useful and I'll explain why later. The quantum of momentum is also a little counterintuitive, but this can be used for electromagnetic energy to calculate the momentum of a photon. And quantum of energy, of course, is Planck's constant uh, with units of energy per cycle. So you may recall from Planck's constant and the nature of light, every cycle of electromagnetic energy contains the same energy regardless of the wavelength. Okay, so uh, if you have more energy per unit time then or more energy cycles per unit time, you're going to have more energy per unit time per second, per hour, per day, per year, whatever your unit of time is, um, that is why you have more energy when you have, um, you know, when, when you accumulate it over time. And finally, in modified unit analysis, I have um, three equations written in the frequency domain uh, for each of these quantum constants. Now I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with this one because this one is more familiar. Um, this one, this equation here is essentially Planck's energy equation, only I'm writing it in terms of my specification here. And um, so uh, the three equations are um, in terms of power, frequency, and matter. Power, frequency, and matter. And so the first one, this is uh, E equals Planck's constant times frequency. Only I'm writing it in terms of power. And I explained this in, in previous videos, but I'm gonna just say it here quickly that the black body experiments that were used to derive Planck's energy equation were uh, reported in terms of power. So they're reported in terms of intensity and intensity has units of power per meter squared. And so, um, so I decided that to write Planck's energy equation in terms of power. And this actually makes more sense. And when, it, when we actually apply this, you'll see that it makes more sense to write it this way. And so this is power equals the quantum of energy, which is Planck's constant, times the frequency of energy, which is the frequency of the electromagnetic um, radiation. And this has units, so quantum of energy has units energy per cycle, and frequency 
has units cycle per second. So this equation here has the units of power because these cycles, you can imagine they cancel. And so you end up with energy per second, joule per second, which is watts. And that's why I use W here. I don't want to use P for power because I use P over here for potential. And so I'm trying to not reuse any characters like they do in mainstream. In mainstream, they use M for mass, but they use M for meter in, in, the, um, in the unit section, which is very confusing or can be very confusing if the writer of an article is not clearly distinguishing between units and the body of the equation, that can be very confusing. So I'm trying not to reuse any characters. So this is power in watts is equal to the quantum of energy times the frequency of the energy. And this will give you the power, um, the power of the um, electromagnetic energy. So when you do it this way, you realize that there is no such thing as a photon. Uh, what we call the photon is really one second worth of energy units because frequency, hertz, is cycles per second in the body of the equation. So frequency is always reported in hertz and hertz is cycles per second. Okay, hertz is cycles per second and not cycles per half second and not cycles per millisecond. It is cycles per second. So writing this equation in terms of power makes it um, clear that the energy of electromagnetic energy is, um, is on a per second basis because power has units of energy per second. Okay, and frequency is per second. So everything is on a per second basis in all of these equations. So the next equation is a force equation. Okay, so if I want to find out the force of um, an electromagnetic uh, signal, if I want to find out the force that, um, say, an X-ray is going to impart on an electron, um, then I would use this equation and it is forces equal to the quantum of kinetic inertia, or you can say the quantum of momentum. So force is equal to quantum of momentum times the frequency of, um, whatever it is that's, that's moving. And that would be, you know, the frequency of the energy as well. So if this was an electromagnetic, um, signal, then you would plug in the frequency of the light and you would get the force that that light would impart on an electron, let's say for the photoelectric effect. And so this has units of momentum, K, kinetic inertia is momentum, momentum, momentum per second, or kilogram meters per second per second. Okay, those are the units of force. The, in modified unit analysis, this is the Newton because the, the cycle, so this um, K per cycle are the unit, is the unit of the quantum of momentum and cycle per second is the um, unit of the frequency and uh, in the final units, uh, you, these would cancel and you would get momentum per second kilogram meter per second per second, which are the units of the Newton. And then I have a companion equation here to complete the specification where I have the matter, the mass, the quantity of mass, okay? The quantity of mass or the matter um, is equal to the quantum of potential quantum of mass, I've called it in the past, but quantum of potential inertia times the frequency of the particle. And this is going to be the frequency. This is going to be the Compton frequency. And I don't know if I'll get into that here. I don't know if I'll, I'll use this in this video. I think I'll have to make another video on that. But this completes, the spe and, and this has nothing to do with the cesium atom in terms of the resonant frequency of the emission and absorption. Emission and absorption 
Uh, only these two equations come into play when we're talking about emission and absorption. Uh, mass is something completely different, but um, this equation is um, written here for completeness and will be used in a completely different uh, scenario. Okay, so here's where we're going to apply the specification uh, modified unit analysis to the, um, the cesium uh, atom and the resonant frequency of the cesium atom, the emission absorption frequency, the frequency of electromagnetic um, radiation is n this number here, cycles per second. So here is the frequency. Okay, and as you remember, the quantum of energy, which is Planck's constant, is here. And it's got units of joule per cycle, energy per cycle. And so to calculate the power that this radiation, that, that this um, frequency would impart on um, another object, like an electron, if you want to calculate the power associated with this radiation, you would use power equals quantum of energy times the frequency and you would get a value like this 6.09 this large number times 10 to the minus 24 joules per second energy per second so this is a power equation this is the power that um, any object emitting this frequency uh, would impart on an object and so, or this is the power, sorry, that would be transferred in, in one second, in one unit of time, which is one second. Now, if we want to calculate the, um, the force that um, this amount of radiation would impart on an object, let's say an electron or some other atom, um, you would use the quantum of, of kinetic, which is the quantum or kinetic inertia. The quantum of kinetic inertia, which is the quantum of momentum, which is this value here, which is uh, which has the units of um, momentum per cycle. So this is on a per cycle basis uh, for each cycle of electromagnetic equation, sorry, each cycle of electromagnetic radiation would impart this amount of force on an object. And so this makes it really easy to calculate the force. You take the um, quantum of for the quantum of momentum, multiply it by the frequency, and you get this value here. Um, uh, 2.03177 times 10 to the minus 32. Uh, newtons. So this would be uh, kilogram meters per second per second, momentum per second, um, and these. this is the units of the newton. And so uh, this value is correct. Okay. This value is also correct. And um, so this is how modified unit analysis could be applied. In fact, I actually use modified unit analysis. I use these principles to solve a real-time problem in a paper that I have up on ResearchGate called Modified Unit Analysis, a real-life example. And the problem is uh, given a, a 0.516 watt laser emitting light with a wavelength of 200, sorry, 726 nanometers, what force would the light emit by such a laser, what force would a laser exert on an object? So this is a real life problem, um, which I write about in this paper. And then I go on to uh, show how modified unit analysis can be used to solve this problem. And so this you know, gives justification for the modified unit analysis approach uh, as it can be applied in real life situations. So now I'm going to talk briefly about relativity. I'm not, I don't know how much detail I'm going to get into because um, I don't want the video to be too long. 
but um, I want to talk about relativity in the frequency domain. But in order to do that, we have to talk about relativity in the, in the reciprocal time domain. So in relativity in, in, in time dilation, in time dilation, this is the equation that's used to calculate the, how much the uh, time has changed when you say take a particle, maybe it's a cesium atom, and you accelerate it towards the speed of light. And so, um, so the, the term time dilation I find is a little confusing because you know dilate means to make bigger, and when you make time bigger, what does that mean? Well, well, we're not talking about time. We're talking about one cycle of time or one period of time. So in modified unit analysis, I write a, a period of time, a unit of time is seconds per cycle. And so the time, so time dilation means that the time for that cycle uh, gets bigger or the time between um, ticks. So time between emission and absorption events um, gets longer, gets bigger. And so, you know, time dilation, I find a little confusing. I actually find it much easier to think in terms of the frequency domain because frequency is you go faster, you go slower. The frequency is faster, the frequency is slower. And I think it's just easier to understand than, than the concept of time dilation. But regardless, um, in order to calculate the relativistic effect of a, a particle in motion, uh, you use this equation. So the, the, the new time is going to be equal to the original time period uh, times this quantity here, which is referred to as gamma. And so gamma is, this equation is used everywhere. This is um, electromagnetic retardation and the theory of relativity by uh, Oleg D. Jeffomenko. Okay, so you've heard Ken Wheeler talk about this book. I bought this book and I read it. There's a crap load of math in this book um, that will make your head spin. Um, so, but you know, it's still kind of interesting to, to go through and to see, um, to, to see his logic and his logic leads to the idea of clock retardation. And so in relativity, uh, time, time dilation is in reality, it's clock retardation. So clocks slow down, which is why I think it's better to do relativity in the frequency domain. Okay. So. Um, so this is, this equation is called gamma. It's not, an, well, I guess it's not an equation. This is actually a, a factor. This is called the gamma factor. And you multiply, you put this into an equation to calculate the relativistic uh, change in the time duration and or the frequency of the signal. Okay, so it's called the gamma factor. Sometimes it's called the Lorentz factor. Sometimes it's written like this. They take the V squared and C squared and, 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 and um, obscure it with this beta term. Uh, I don't find this very useful whatsoever. So here we go. So when you convert to the frequency domain, what you do is you take the reciprocal. So you flip so the one's on the bottom and this uh, is on top. And so here it is written in the frequency domain. The, uh, uh, the frequency that you get out is going to be the source. So the frequency received is the frequ frequency sent times this factor. And um, I, would I would refer to this as the alpha factor, not the gamma factor because the gamma factor is the inverse, is the inverse. And so already um, relativity in the frequency domain is much simpler because you don't have to remember one over this term. You just have to remember this term. And this, you know, this equation has the units of cycles per second. Okay, cycles per second. And when you see them both together, so you see that the um, the frequency domain is the reciprocal of, so you, this is on top and the one is on the bottom. Of course, you, in, in, in the equation, you don't have to rate the one because this is in fact the numerical value of one, um, not the unit of one in the unit. This is in the body of the equation and one, that number does not belong in the unit section. 
right? And so in the time domain, you've got seconds per cycle. and the frequency domain, you've got cycles per second. So this is relativity in the frequency domain. So this equation here uh, gets added to my specification because it's an important part um, of um, what happens to a particle that is resonating at a certain frequ frequency. So basically, if I took a, a cesium atom that is resonating at 9 billion um, hertz and I um, send it to... I accelerate it towards the speed of light. This frequency is going to decrease. You can see this frequency, the frequency is going to decrease as I accelerate the particle towards the speed of light. And of course, if I accelerate it to the speed of light, then um, this is going to become zero. The frequency is going to be zero. The cesium atom will no longer um, emit and absorb energy. And that, that's how I see it anyways. In, uh, when you do physics in the frequency domain, I think it's much simpler. This is almost, you could solve almost any physics problem using everything that you see on this page. And so um, because we're now we're getting into um, ether circulation and the ether is the medium for the propagation of light, um, I thought that it might be good to take a few steps back and look at um, the frequency domain, look at modified unit analysis in the frequency domain. And uh, in the future, I may be using um, this setup here to, uh, to solve problems. But as I said before, I was able to, um, to use it to solve a simple problem, a simple desktop problem uh, involving a, a laser and, um, the, and trying to measure the force that it imparts on an object which can be measured. So uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, I know there's lots more there's lots more to talk about. There's also the um, there's a Doppler shift, there's non-relativistic Doppler shift and the relativistic uh, Doppler shift, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, I think that just might confuse you more than anything, but I think so therefore I think I will just leave it at that.